Gospel according to St. Luke chapter 1, we begin our reading at verse 18. That's a few verses. Here begins the reading of God's holy word. And Zechariah said unto the angel, Whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife well stricken in years. And the angel answered and said unto him, I am Gabriel, that stand in the presence of God, and I'm sent to speak unto thee, and to show thee these glad tidings. Hallelujah. And behold, thou shalt be dumb and not able to speak unto the day that these things shall be performed, because thou believest not my words, which shall be fulfilled in their season. So, Father, text let us pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you. Your word is a lamp unto our feet and it's a light unto our path. Lord, we thank you for all that you are and have been. But today, God, we pray that you would manifest yourself in a special way in our midst through the preaching and the teaching of your word. Now, God, I am nothing without you, God. When I'm weak, that's when you're strong. So think with my mind, speak with my mouth, move through my body, have your way. We pray, God, that no weapon formed against the word shall prosper in any way. But all people shall hear the word, and the elect shall be through as well. We give you thanks today that every word that shall go forth shall hit the heart of every person under the sound of my voice. No one will leave the way that they came. We give you the thanks, we give you the praise, and we give you the honor in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Come on, clap your hands and give them a strong praise. Before you have your seat, let me your name and say, neighbor, the delay was deliverance. But they don't want to call. Look at the one say, neighbor, the delay was deliverance. The delay was deliverance. Thank you. Amen. In this season in the Christian church, it is known as Advent. Amen. A very important season where we are waiting for the arrival of someone important. Yeah. A noticeable person, right. thing, or event to happen. Uh -huh. It also represents the second coming of Christ. We are waiting. How many of you know that Jesus has already come, but he's coming again? All right. And the saints of God are eagerly anticipating the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. So this season of Advent is to celebrate and to wait. It says that we have not stopped waiting for Jesus to come back. Uh -huh. I know people have been saying it for decades that the Lord is coming back any day, but this season of our Christian life is a time where we declare to God we're still waiting for you to come. Oh, yeah. We haven't given up. We haven't thrown in the towel about your return. We are still waiting for you to come, and our cry is hasten, Lord, return to your people. Amen. One of the major themes of Advent is expectancy. Someone say expectancy. <laughs> expectancy means to think or hope for something to happen. You don't have any proof. You don't know how it's going to happen. You don't know when it's going to come. All you know is that it's something down in the pit of your stomach that causes you to believe for something to come. How many of you understand what it means to be in expectancy? Ah, uh, you believe in God to work for you. You don't know how God's going to work it, but you know he's going to do it. You don't know where he's going to do it, you just know he's going to do it. You don't know when he's going to bring it forth. You just know down in your soul. Something gives you the ability to trust and believe that God is going to do it. A great example of expectancy is when you're expecting a child. When you're waiting for the birth of the child, you don't know if it's going to be a boy or a girl. You don't know what it's going to look like. You don't know if it's going to stay in there for the full nine months or it's going to come early. But all you know is a baby in there. And sooner or later, that baby's going to come out. Sooner or later, we're going to be going to the hospital and we're going to have a new life come into the world. But the question is this. Can you wait when you have no proof? All right, all right, all right. Can you wait when you have no evidence? Right. And nothing symbolizes expectancy like prayer. Someone say prayer. prayer. When you present your request before God, you have to wait by faith for God to do it, don't you? Oh, yeah. But one thing I can tell you for certain, 
that our God is a prayer answering God. Yes, oh, I should have got 500 witnesses up in here. I said, our God is a prayer answering God. Just let your mind go back to this time last year where you were. You are so much further ahead. I know you don't have everything you want, and you might not have all the money you want to have, and you might not have all the help you want to have, but look where he brought you from. Look at the progress he has brought you from this time last year to this time. God has answered some prayers. But let's keep it real up in here. You wouldn't be here if it wasn't for God stepping into your situation and answering some prayers. Can I get somebody to help me pray God for the fact that he answers prayers? Oh, y'all still sitting there? Can I get a witness in the house that God answers prayer? He may not come when you want, but he's always right on time. He steps into the mess with you, and he snatches you out before the enemy gets his hand on you. Our God is faithful, and he answers prayer. But what do you do? When it seems like God hasn't hurt you. What do you do when God seems to not answer your prayers? Even though God is a prayer answering God, there are times in our Christian life where it seems like God has turned a deaf ear and a blind eye to us. Can I get a witness? Oh, I know you might not want to tell the truth, but pit it up in here. Oh, but I'll tell the truth for you. There are seasons in Christian life where you ask God and you prayed and you cried and you fasted and you believed God, but it seems like nothing is happening. And you begin to say, God, how long do I wait? How long do I keep believing? Can I get a witness? How long do I keep praying the same prayer and I don't get an answer? Been praying for my son to be saved for 20 years. And it seems like the more I pray, the worse he gets. Been praying for God to heal my body. But every time I go to the doctor, they give me another diet. Diagnosis, huh? But believing God for my finances to change, huh? but I just can't keep my account out the negative. Huh? Keep praying, keep praying. Huh? But how long do you keep praying and God don't answer? You know, years ago I heard a prominent preacher say that if God doesn't answer your prayer in three years, you should stop praying. Wow. That may grieve my spirit because you can never put a timetable of God. How can you put a timetable on the work of God? Just because God didn't do it today, don't mean God's not going to do it. That's because God doesn't do it this year, doesn't mean God is not going to do it. It's all according to the timing of God. There's three possible reasons. You don't mind if I just teach a little bit, set up foundation, and we'll jump in the text. There's three possible reasons why God might not answer your prayers. The first reason is that you pray amiss. Write this down. James chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. James chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. It says, From whence comes wars and fightings amongst you? Come they not hence, even of your lust that war in your members? Ye lust and have not. Ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Ye ask, listen, and receive not, because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lust. So sometimes God does not answer our prayers because we have the wrong motives. We don't want it for the right thing. You want it, but you're not going to use it for the right thing. You want it, but it's going to take you further away from God. So then he doesn't give it to you. Well, y'all don't like that one. Okay. And you know it's not for you because you don't ever see it. Not that you don't ever see it, but you don't feel a witness in your soul that God's going to give it to you. Can I get a witness that you pray for something and God don't do it? And you know that in your soul, God ain't going to do it. Don't care how much you cry. Don't matter how much you pray. He just ain't going to do that. Because it's not in alignment with his will and your motives are wrong. The second reason why your prayers might not be answered is because of demonic hindrance. Right. Say demonic hindrance. Demonic. Daniel chapter 10. Write that down. Daniel chapter 10 verses 12 through 14. Daniel chapter 10 verses 12 through 14. And it says, Then said he unto me, this is an angel speaking to Daniel, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thy heart to understand and to chasten thyself before God, thy words were heard. Yeah. And I came for thy words, but the prince yeah. of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. Right. Listen to what it's saying. Stop there. Notice what he's saying. The day that Daniel presented his request to God, 
God released the answer. But there was a demonic prince, a demon who had rulership over the region that blocked the answer. Some of your answers God has released, but there's a demon that's blocking it. Oh, I know you don't want to hear me talk about demons, but you better hear me today. There's some demonic spirits blocking your request from coming. How do you know it? Have you ever prayed and knew God heard you, but you just don't know why it's held up? You can feel it down in your soul. I know God heard my prayer, and I know my answer is on the way, but why is it taking so long? You get this sense down in your soul that it shouldn't be taking this long for this request to come to me. Maybe there's a demon standing in the way. And the Bible tells us that the way to get rid of that is some things go only by prayer and fasting. And so we see Daniel begins to pray and fast. And as he prays and fasts, God releases Michael, the warring angel, in verse 13, to come and help him to release the angel to bring the answer to Daniel. So some of your prayers is not that God didn't answer it. It's that you need to get in the spirit and fight to release your answer. Amen. Then the third reason is that the delay is deliberate, not because it's a demon, but because God delayed it on purpose. In our text today, we find that God will sometimes hold up his answer for a reason. It's not that he's not going to answer you. It's not that he doesn't want to answer you. It's just he's not going to answer you right now. Not that he doesn't want to bless you. Not that he doesn't want to increase you. He's not going to do it right now. And in our text, we find a man by the name of Zechariah. Zechariah was of the priesthood. He was one of the priests. He was a son of Aaron. He also was married to a woman who was also of the priesthood by the name of Elizabeth. They were different from the other priests in that they actually was right. Back in those days, most of the priests looked righteous on the outside, but their insides were filthy. Amen. You know, people ask me all the time, why is it that so many preachers are a hot mess? Well, many of them are just like the priests of the Bible. Uh, yeah. They look good on the outside, but their insides are messed up. They're just as hateful as a sinner. They're just as gossipy and lying as a sinner. Oh, y'all quiet today. Y'all can't talk because the saints just as worse. So y'all can't say nothing. It's okay. I know you can't talk because you're talking about yourself. You know, one of my mentors said, you know, the saints don't shout above how they live. You know. I know you can't shout because I'm talking about you, but that's okay. There's a difference. There's a difference. There's a one. There's a difference in the house. They were righteous inside and out. They wasn't just going through the motions. But they were striving to be right. They were not perfect. But they strive every day to be in right relationship with God. Amen. And because of this, they were different from the other priests. They didn't even live in the city. They lived outside the city in the hills. They were country people. Lived up in the hills. They didn't want to live up in a big house and fancy with all the other people. They were different. Fully devoted to God. They were righteous but they were childless. They were righteous, but they didn't have any children. Can I speak to something that a lot of Christians struggle with? Just because you're right, don't mean you're always going to have everything you want. Just because you come to church every Sunday don't mean that God going to give you everything you ask for. Just because you dot every I across every T and no one does, does not mean that everything is going to always fall in line. Can we allow God to insert problems into our life and still trust Him? Oh, let me say that again. Can we trust God to insert problems and crisis? And ups and downs in our life, and we still trust Him, and we still serve Him, and we still do what He's asked us to do. It was a big issue in those days to be barren. It was a big issue not to have kids because they believed that by not having children, by a woman being barren, it was a sign from God that He was displeased with them, that they did not have favor with Him, that He had divine judgment against their life. And although Zechariah and Elizabeth appeared to be righteous, uh -huh. the people were talking about them behind their back. Have you ever been in the midst of folks that they're talking about you right yeah. now? They're standing in their face, yeah. saying, they look righteous. Yeah. They sound holy, 
but something got to be going on. Got to be a little secret in there. Because if they were so right, then why they ain't got no children? Oh, come on, you've been there before. You thank you all this and that. If you love the Lord that much and all this was going on, why you can't keep your bills paid? Why you can't keep a job? Why you can't keep no man, can't keep a woman? Why you can't keep no relationship? If, 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 if you're so righteous, if you love the Lord so much, why is your life lacking productivity? Why are you not bearing fruit? Let me tell you something. Not bearing fruit does not have anything to do with righteousness. I know that is proper English. I want you to hear me, though. Bearing fruit has to do with God's timing. Come on. Think about it. Because sinners are bearing fruit every day. So it has nothing to do with righteousness. It has to do with God's timing and what God wants to do in your life when he gets ready to do it in your life. And so here you have these people who are righteous, doing the right thing, but being whispered about and talked about because they don't have a child. But I want to declare to people today who feel like this barren woman, faithful to God, but struggling. Consistent in God, mm -hmm. but don't seem to be producing like everyone else expects you. Mm -hmm. Your season of barrenness is coming to an end. Amen. I don't know who that was for. See, y'all sitting there. Some of you all who know, see, I understand. You don't want nobody to know that you're struggling. Ah, oh, but if you're desperate for God to intervene, receive that word by faith that your season of barrenness is over. God is getting ready to visit you, and he's getting ready to break the barrenness in your life, and he's getting ready to cause you to produce fruit that all people will see and say, we know that there is a God. If that's you, come on, open your mouth and praise God, and receive my faith that your season of barrenness is over. Zechariah and Elijah prayed for a child. We don't know how long the scripture doesn't tell us, but I'm sure they prayed for years, probably even decades, and no child. See why you can't put a time limit on God? They prayed for decades. They were well advanced in age, and the scholars say that means they were at least over 60. So it didn't seem like there was any hope to have any children. She was barren, and they were too old, even if he could do something, or she could do something, they were too old anyhow. They were well up in age. You follow me? You track it with me? Yeah. So in the natural, it seemed impossible. But that does not stop what God has ordained to be in the spiritual. Aren't you glad we serve a God that's big enough and powerful enough that no matter what's going on in your natural state, he can override your natural by putting super on your natural and giving you exactly what you need despite what nature says. So just because your prayers seem delayed does not mean that they're denied. They're just being held up for a season. Because God is getting ready to set you up for the impossible. I don't know who this is for today. Some of you have had a prayer before God for years. You've been seeking God consistently for years. And you just feel like you don't know when it's going to happen. May I prophesy and declare to you today that not only is God getting ready to break your barrenness, uh, but God is getting ready to give you your requests. Uh, and it's going to be so big and so magnanimous uh, that it's going to blow your mind. It's going to blow the mind of so many people. Get ready. God is getting ready to do the impossible for you. And if you know that you're next in line uh, for God to do the impossible, uh, if you know you're next in line for God to work a miracle, I tell you to open your mouth and pray for God. Zachariah has gone to do his duty in the temple. Amen. The Bible tells us that he's in his course. Yeah. And there are 24 courses of priests that David said, courses of just groups. So there's 24 groups of priests. There's at least 1,000 priests in each group. So there's almost over 20,000 priests at this time. All right. So people say, why are there so many ministers? There's nothing wrong with having ministers. As long as they know what they're doing, they're doing what they're supposed to do. There were over 20,000 ministers. 
priests in the temple. And Zechariah was a part of the eighth course, the course of a beer. Oh, y'all missed that. And yeah, I said he was part of the eighth course. You're not happy because you don't know what eight means. <laughs> but eight is the number of new beginnings. God says, I'm going to position you in a new beginning. So what's been happening all the years you've been praying don't mean nothing now because I put you in a new day. I put you in a new season. I put you in a new place. So the past has no bearings on what's about to happen now because God has brought you into your new day. You should touch three people and say, I'm in a new day. I don't care what happened last year. This is a new day. I don't care what happened 10 years ago. This is a new day. So he's in the eighth course. And they go to the temple and lost a cast. And of all of the people in his court, out of the thousand priests in his court, the lots led on him to have the most important job. All right, all right. And that is to go into the holies of holies. A once and a lifetime opportunity. And you can't choose to go in there. You have to be selected by lots. Uh -huh. You don't hear what I'm saying? You can say, I'm going in the holies of holies. No, you have to be selected by lots. So the people rolled it, but it was God that selected it. Huh? I want you to know that what God's about to set you up for, I know you want to go in there, you can't get yourself in there, but God's about to set it up where he's going to select you, and pick you to go into your moment so that you can receive what you've been believing God for. He knows a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Oh, I wish you would hear what God is saying. He's been holding you up because he's about to give you a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Oh, I know you've been waiting for years, but God says, I'm going to make the wait worth it. I know you've been praying and crying for years, but I'm about to make your tears turn into joy because what I'm about to do for you is going to be a once-in-a-lifetime he goes in, he picks two of his friends, and one of the friends goes and he clears off the sacrifice with Eva. And then the other one comes in worshipfully and he lays the coals uh, for this sacrifice. And then here's Zachariah getting the chance of a lifetime. The chance to lead the people into worship. Huh? Not all the priests got a chance to get up and be the lead worshiper. Huh? Right. Ah, we don't understand worship because worship is so everywhere. We we cheapen worship. That's why we gotta beg people to praise the Lord and we gotta beg people to clap their hands. But back in that day, everyone can lead the worship. He, he came up in to the holies of holies. Uh -huh. And he stood in the presence of God and he began to swing the golden incense. Yeah. He began to swing it over oh, the coals. And as he began to swing it over the coals, huh, there was this aroma and fragrance that would rise up to God. Huh, and as he swing in an incense, oh, praise the Lord. Huh, the saints were outside lifting up their prayers. Huh. He was saying, Lord, uh, we're not righteous in our own selves, huh, but we need you to hear our prayers. Huh. God, we make worthy to come to you uh, as we lift up this worship to you. Uh, to hear our prayers. Uh, I come to tell you that when you learn how to worship God in spirit and in truth, uh, you will set yourself up to get what you've been praying for. And I submit to you that part of the reason why you ain't getting no answer is because you don't worship. Uh. You come to church and nod your head, uh, but you don't worship. Uh. You come to church and clap your hands, uh, but from your spirit you're not worshiping. I ain't talking about what you're doing on the outside, but in your heart, in your spirit, are you saying, Lord, I love you. Uh. Lord, I you are. I would not mean nothing without you. Should have been dead and gone, but because of your grace and your mercy, I'm still here. Do I have any worshipers in the house today? I want to be worshiping the Lord for a few minutes. Let the worshipers come on and be a worshiper. Let the worshipers come on and be a worshiper. Let the worshipers come on and be a worshiper. Let the worshipers come on and be a worshiper. Let the worshipers come on and be a worshiper. Let the worshipers come on and be a worshiper. Let the worshipers come on and be a worshiper. Let the worshipers come on and be a worshiper. Let the worshipers come on and be a worshiper. Let the worshipers come on and be a worshiper. Let the worshipers come on and be a worshiper. Let the worshipers come on and be a worshiper. Let the worshipers come on and be a worshiper. Let the worshipers come on and be a worshiper. Let the worshipers come on and be a worshiper. Let the worshipers come on and be a worshiper. Let if you learn how to worship him, don't get mad, worship him. Don't stop cussing and start worshiping him. It might not be going the way you want it, but just worship him. Worship, worship, worship. You know, and as he begins to worship, as the fragrance begins to rise, in the right corner, there appeared an angel. Zechariah looked and he got a phrase. Oh my God. There's an angel. And I'm like, God, why is he afraid of the angel? I thought it was because, you know, in the Old Testament, if God didn't accept your sacrifice, he would kill the priest. God says, that's not it. So I kept reading. He says, where is this in the Bible? 
We're going to sit down. I'm still talking. We're just talking. He said, he said, Lord, where's this happening in the Bible? He said, Lord, it's in the Gospels. He says, what does it come in front of? I said, oh, it comes before Malachi. He said, what happened between Malachi and the Gospels? I said, you were silent for 400 years. There was no voice of God for 400 years. There was no prophecy in 400 years. There was no divine revelation or visitation for 400 years. So the first angelic visitation in 400 years happened to Zechariah. Y'all should have gone and run around this place. What God's about to do for you, he's about to break a pattern when he visits you. He's about to do something he ain't did for nobody else. You should touch somebody and say, he's going to do something for me that he ain't did for nobody else.
Right. So God delayed your answer to see your heart and for you to see your own heart. That's right. In this season, God is showing us our hearts. Yeah. He's revealing to us who we really are. Not to hurt us, not to embarrass us, but because he loves us enough to say, get it together. Yeah. Oh, come on. How I many you know you need God to get you together every day? all day throughout the day because I know I'm a mess. Ah, but do you know you're a mess? So if you don't know it, God will use your situation to show you the motive of your heart. Notice, he never stopped his priestly duties. Have you stopped your Christian duties? Have you, are you certain but you're bitter in your heart because God ain't gave you what you want? All right. And you're tired of being around the Negroes talking about you. You know they're talking about you, but God won't release you to leave. All right. All right. <laughs> Damn. It'd be better if you didn't have to be around people talking about you, but God won't let you leave them. Right. You got to serve people talking about you. Right. And you do it and still trust God. Right. That's why you cannot be bitter from delay. Yeah. If you're bitter in your delay, then you're going to miss your moment. Yeah. All right. Imagine if Zechariah said, you know what, I'm tired of going up there every year. I'm tired of going to Jerusalem. I asked God to give me a child. He ain't gave me a child. I ain't going to Jerusalem. All right. I know it's my, my group's turn to go. I ain't going up there because I'm tired of God ignoring me. And I'm tired of going up with those fake priests. They fake anyway. And they talking about me and my wife. Now I got to come all the way from the countryside down here to the city. And you know I don't fool with the city. You're not country folks. We don't fool with the city. No, I've been saying I ain't a country party. I ain't trying to come over to the city. And now I got to come to the city to deal with fake priests yeah. that talk about me. He could say, I'm not going. That's right. I'm not doing it. But look at what he would have missed. That's right. Yeah. He would have missed his moment that he's been waiting for Jesus. for over 40 years. Wow. If he had to stay there. Beware of a tit for tat mentality. Yeah. All right. A lot of Christians got a tit for tat. Talk. You do this. You don't do this, I can do this. You don't speak to me, I can say that's why some of y'all don't speak to me. I don't care, I'll come speak to you anyway. You be mad with me, I love you. Pray for you. Walk out if you want to, I'll snatch you back. Come on back over here and speak to me. We don't speak to people based on how we feel. We don't serve in the kingdom of God based on how we feel. We do it because God is in us and He commands it to be so. But He also delays answers so that he can exceed our expectation. Pay for praying for a son. Mm -hmm. God just give us a son, an average Joe Blow, and this average boy so he can learn the priesthood and yeah. follow the steps of me. Yeah. All right. So he can just be an average boy running around Jerusalem, <laughs> running around the hillsides. But what God wanted to give him was much bigger than just a son. Yeah. What God wanted to give Zechariah and Elizabeth was much bigger than a priest. Yeah. They wanted to give him the forerunner to the Messiah. Yeah. They wanted to give him the voice that would cry out in the wilderness, preparing the way for Jesus. Oh, I want you to hear what 